These people understand very well that a revolution means a new situation. Revolution means that the abuses and excesses of the violent, reactionary, and disruptive minority has to be crushed so that the majority interests can prevail. So today I just want to sort of finish setting this scene here with Abram and remember Genesis here that we have remembered if we could remember here in Genesis chapter 12 I know for people watching online yes we got to get a full review Yeah, so we have to do a, you know, I like to do a little review here. And uh, Genesis, the 12th chapter, we recall that Abraham was being brought out of his own country. Genesis 12 and 1, it says, Now the, now the Lord has said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will swear unto thee, or show thee, excuse me. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, that thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. And it says, So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot, Went him and Lot, or and Lot went with him. And Abram was seventy-five years old when he departed out of Haran. Abram took Sarai his wife and Lot his brother's son and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan. And into the land of Canaan they came. Now, in verse seven it reads, and the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there built he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. So all of the land of Canaan he is going to give to Abraham and his children. Now I want to establish this because we're way in Genesis. And uh, I want to show how it affects us to this day. If we are, as they would say, as we would say, Bible believers. And I want to continue in uh, Genesis Let's see here. so he's being called again he said he would give them the lands if we go over to chapter 15 I believe we have read that before chapter 15 it says in verse 5 Genesis chapter 15 and 5 and he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven. Speaking, this is what the Creator did with Abraham. He brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed the Lord, and it was counted, and he counted it to him for righteousness. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee forth, or I am the Lord that brought thee out of where? Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he, here's where you get the 400 year prophecy. Uh, we have teachings on the 400 year prophecy. I won't go into it today. But we're showing that Abraham was called out of the land of Ur to receive the land of Canaan where he will bring forth children and build a great nation. If we go over to chapter 17, uh, it reads, and when Ab verse 1, And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to, to Abram and said to him, I am the almighty God, walk before me and be thou perfect. 
and I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thy seed exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be called Abraham, a father of many nations, have I made of thee. I will make thee exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. So we still see land, we see a nation being built, and we see in a political order. King. We're talking about a king, we're talking about a political order, we're talking about an administration of, of, uh, of government and rule. This is what's being promised to Abram being called out of the land of Chaldees. And remember, when we read all of these, now he's making a covenant. He said, my covenant is with you. And he's going to give them the sign of the covenant of circumcision and everything else, right? Now, I would, I'm going to read this as well. This is my covenant, verse 10. Verse 10. This is my covenant which, I, which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. And you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man, child in your generations. He that is born in the house or bought with money, any stranger of any stranger which is not of thy seed. So, they all shall be circumcised, whoever part of Abraham's house. Why am I reading circumcision? Because this was a promise made that Abraham shall receive a land, an administration of, 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 of kings and rulers shall come forth out of him, and a mighty nation shall come forth out of him. Now, Genesis 18, which we read before, in the last video, I, I know those of you who've seen video eight, we're reviewing it because we want to walk into something here and bring something else to the table. So Genesis 18 explains, in Genesis chapter 18, Verse 17, it reads, And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham the thing which I do? So he was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. So he's explaining, I will not hide this from Abraham. I'm going to tell him exactly what I'm going to do. And we dealt with the last teaching talking about the imperialism of Sodom and Gomorrah and Abraham conflict with Babylon, those kings. We dealt with that last week. Now I want to bring something else out here. Again, to bring back to our memory, verse 18 reads, Seeing. I'm going to let him know what I'm going to do because Abraham, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, which we've been reading about in chapter 12, chapter 14, 15, and we're learning he shall become a great mighty nation because this is part of the covenant. Remember that? And, shall, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. So this is a part of the covenant. God making a covenant. Verse 19. For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him. And we explain all those who were born in his house and everyone who was a part of his household had to be circumcised. So everyone who's joining on to this covenant of Abraham and to be a part of his household after him and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken. So in order for all of this to come to pass, justice and judgment, these kings coming out of Abraham, the land being given unto him, the blessings of his sons, and all nations of the earth be blessed. Abraham children got to do justice and judgment in order to bring this to pass. Now, this was a covenant made. Right? And I want to bring this in so we can look at something here. Um, if we take our journey to the book of Galatians, in fact, I want to go to the book of Romans first. The book of Romans, chapter 15. So all of these promises that was made about straightening out this earth, because remember, we have this rebel teachings and policies filling the world. That rebel was Nimrod. Now, Abraham, a covenant was made with Abraham that his children shall be the instruments and the vehicles used to bring justice and judgment in the world. Now, when we go to the book of Romans, 
This will probably put in context the hope that Paul had. And if we go to Romans chapter 15 and verse 7, let's confirm something here. Romans chapter 15, verse 7 reads, Wherefore, receive ye one another as Christ, or Hamashiach, the Messiah, also receive us to the glory of God. Now notice, he's signifying Jesus of Nazareth as being Christ, the Messiah, the King. Because remember he said, King shall come out of Abraham. So in essence, when we're looking at Christ, we're looking at one of the kings, or the king, the primary king, which is to come forth out of Abraham. Wherefore receive ye one another as also he received us. Now notice verse 8. Now I say that Jesus king or the Messiah or the Christ was a minister of what? The circumcision. Remember this covenant? He was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. So the idea or the promise way with Abraham millennia ago of the creator raising up his children to bring judgment and justice in the earth, now it has been confirmed with the Messiah. That means it shall surely happen. So we're talking a thousand years later, Paul writing, explaining everything we just finished reading in order that God may bring all this upon Abraham, this covenant, the Messiah have fulfilled this. He confirmed these promises. Now let's go to Galatians. In fact, before we go to Galatians, look at this. Eight days old, they had to be circumcised, right? Now, if we go to the Gospels, and possibly I want the book of John. Let me hear. Let me let me go ahead and hear the book of John, chapter 19. And notice this, verse 21. No, in fact, verse 19. John 19, 19. This is the Messiah they crucified. In fact, let's go up a little higher so we can get this in. Let's see where we're going with this. All right. Now, after they had crucified him, verse 16, well, they're getting ready to crucify him. It says, verse 16, after he was arrested by the authorities, then delivered he him there, uh, therefore unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of, the, of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha. There, or where they crucified him and two other with him, on either side, or on either side one, and Jesus in the midst. We have teachings on these two thieves too. It's very interesting about them too. Who they really, who they were. They were bandits. They were revolutionaries themselves, but they were after a different order of violence. But nevertheless, verse 19. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. And the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city. And it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. So here is explaining, all right, so some of them was reading Yeshua, some of them was reading Jesus. It was all written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin for all of the different languages of the Hebrews in which they were speaking at that time. But notice this. They say, Brother Jude, where are you going with this? Circumcision. It was a sign of the covenant, right? Now notice what happened. Then said the chief priest of the Jews to Pilate, write not the king of the Jews, but... He said, but he said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. Verse 23, when the soldier, then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments. Now, who had his garments? The soldiers. That means his garments wasn't on him, was it? That's right. So he was up on the cross naked? Yep. So it says, then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier, and part also, 
and to every soldier a part, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from top throughout. Then said they therefore among themselves, Let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, and the scriptures might be fulfilled. Which saith, They parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things therefore the soldiers did. Now there stood by the cross Jesus' mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. Now, what do we have here? We have the Roman soldiers gambling for the Messiah's reign. Therefore, what we're learning, or what we may look over in this teaching, is that the Messiah is actually on the cross naked. Is there any significance there? He's on the cross, and I want to skip down to finishing this. When, verse 30. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Other scriptures teach darkness came and everything else. What are you looking at at this very moment? The Messiah naked. Romans 15 declared. No. Romans 15 declared he hath confirmed the promises made unto the fathers. So when everyone who's beholding him at this moment on the cross, what do they see? They see a circumcised man. Yeah, okay. They're beholding the covenant, the sign of the covenant that he's confirming at that very hour. Remember the sign of Abraham's covenant with circumcision in the foreskin. Now they crucify the Messiah, and that's actually what everyone who's beholding at this very hour. See, he ain't had no clothes on. So they're looking at now, not only are they beholding this covenant being confirmed by the crucifixion, they're also witnessing the sign upon the Christ, the Christ himself of the promises or the covenant made with Abraham. And I believe it was very significant for the people to behold and see the circumcised flesh of the Christ because that was the token and sign to Abraham. And here it is being revealed. Now let's go to the book of Galatians. Here it is being revealed, this Messiah. Galatians, third chapter. Showing the world the sign of Abraham in his flesh and also bearing the cross and laying his life down for many to bring these promises to pass. Now, in Galatians chapter 3, notice what the, what the apostle saw argues. And I'll start reading at verse 13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Curse is everyone that hangeth on the tree. He redeemed us from the condemnation of the first covenant. See, the first covenant was we got to kick this job off and fulfill what God said to Abraham. Well, we failed. Our fathers failed. Therefore, we fell up under a curse. That curse was you break this law, condemnation. Now the Messiah have, has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Here, law is in the context of the first covenant. Not the moral Ten Commandments, not the sacrificial law, not none of that. We're talking about the whole covenant. And he's going to explain it here. Law and, the law and first covenant is, are interchangeable. Curses everyone that hangeth on the tree. Verse 14. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus, of, of Jesus Christ or, 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 or the Messiah. That we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Because remember, the part of the promises was that the Gentiles should be blessed. 
And notice the significance. We're, we're not just talking Jesus of Nazareth, but the association of him being king. Because it's the king or the ruler who's going to bring forth policies to redeem the nations. Verse 15. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, yet it could be confirmed. We read in Romans 15 that this covenant was confirmed. No man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Meaning, what God had promised in Genesis, all of us could rest assured today, it shall surely come to pass. So the redemption from oppression, the redemption from our hard toil among us who, uh, who, who believe or who have been revealed, we are the Israelites, and among the Gentiles or the nations, and this is what we read, what we're listening to on some of these videos, the toil of the nations, rest assured that the Christ have confirmed these promises and the covenant which was made. Now he said, brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man could take away from it or add to it. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He said, not into seeds as of many, but as of one and to thy seed, which is Christ. What we have Paul here, uh, Saul is uh, signaling out the confirmer of the covenant or the chief ruler, which we understand to be the Messiah. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the covenant of none effect. So he's not talking about People separate the law as they try to separate it from the covenant. What he's explaining here, notice, and we have numbers. We, we do the whole, the number countdown in the book of Genesis to show you from the time that God made the promises we were just reading in Genesis chapter 12 until Moses redeemed the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt was 430 years. So what he's arguing, the law that came 430 years after the promises made to Abraham, all these promises we read about, that law, that, which was the whole law code on Mount Sinai, just because the children of Israel broke that first covenant, it will not disannul the promises that God had promised Abraham, that a seed shall come forth out of you, uh, uh, all nations that, that, that shall fill the earth, the land of Canaan, all nations shall be blessed in you. And you and your children shall bring justice and judgment into the earth. All of these promises we are learning by Paul in Galatians and in Romans that they can't be broken. They can't be broken. And I wanted to establish that, that to confirm that, look, our hope in the redemption of humanity, it has been confirmed. So people who believe, so, which they call the so-called New Testament, so you would know what testament means. Testament just means covenant. People say we're not under the old covenant. They think we're talking, they think they're talking about the, people say we're not under the old testament. They think they're talking about the books from Genesis to Malachi. No. Old Testament means Old Covenant. All you have to do is look it up. When we're saying we're not under the Old Covenant, we're saying we're not under the Old Testament. Nothing to do with the books. Simply the covenant made. And that covenant that was made, which we call the Old Covenant, was a covenant made with Moses on Mount Sinai with all of the law. But that, because Israel broke that, that doesn't mean that the covenant he made with Abraham is disannulled. So he's making a new covenant or a new testament. So a new testament isn't the books from Matthew to Revelation. That's not the new testament. The new testament is the new covenant. This new covenant, which everyone claimed that they're under, is confirming the fact that oppression shall be destroyed. That is what the new covenant is pointing towards. Now, taking that journey, I want us to go back again now because he have called Abraham out of the land of the Chaldeans, the land of earth. 
And I want to see if we can put this together. Because in this world, this modern world, everybody claiming they're up under the new covenant. But we're learning that the new covenant is none other than the promises made to Abraham and his children to bring justice and judgment into the earth. And all nations of the world should be blessed in him. And a nation shall come forth out of him to bring equity and judgment. Now all of these people claim they're under the new covenant now. That usually don't come in their conversation. Now let us go back to Abraham. Abraham, this is out of a book, let's establish something. This is out of a book called Babylon. All right, it was written by Albert Cantor or Champdor. Chapter 4. Remember I mentioned that Babylon is the land of the, is the city of the gate of the gods? I just want to confirm it to you from where I got it from. Chapter 4, entitled, The City of Babylon. It reads, the site of Babylon was certainly occupied in prehistoric times, as it attests by flint, by flint implements and other stone objects recovered there. The Sumerian name for it was Kadingara, Kadingara, which became in Akkadian Babli, or Babli, or Babylon, which is interpreted gate of the God, or gate of the gods. Gate is also representative of city. So Babylon was the city of the gods, and we've been trying to establish through these teachings that it was a land where the aristocrats were able to live in luxury. Now keep it in mind, because I, I mean, we, I, I want, I'm trying to draw this together the best I can. Here we are today among Babylon, mystery Babylon, where the aristocrats are forming cities, towns, nations, where they can be at ease and uh, live in luxury while the mass is toy. But the covenant made with Abraham in the beginning was to be in opposition to that. Right? Isn't that what we learned? So if Christ is confirming the same covenant made to Abraham, those who are under the new covenant are supposed to be the same way in opposition to the ways of Babylon. You see where we're going with this? Now let's learn more about the ways of Babylon before we close out because this is going to lead us into our future studies of um, the, the, the principles, getting more into the government, and, uh, what we learned in the video today and what you were talking about today about the Industrial Revolution. All of this is important, I believe, because it's some mysterious stuff in the book of Revelation that can sort of explain possibly some of this stuff. Now, in ancient Mesopotamian economy, um, we have read this, I, I can't recall if we read this one last week, but anyway, just for a review, ancient Mesopotamian economy, where Abraham is, where the gate of the God is, Babylon, Mesopotamia, this is where God called Abraham out of to make a covenant with him. He called him out of this society or civilization. Now, note it. If you know about Mesopotamia economy, you will know how the financial situation was during the dawn of civilization. Reviewing this, the dawn of civilization was Mesopotamia and its economy. This was the dawn of civilization. Primary trade and commerce, which led to economic development, was triggered after the farmers learned the art of irrigating the land. Giving its strategic location in the Fertile Crescent, Mesopotamia had well-developed agriculture. In the city-state of Sumer, Ur was a major center for trade and commercial activities. But temples were the primary source of employment and were the hub of all commercial activities. The economy of Mesopotamia depended on where people lived. Transportation in the economy of Mesopotamia received a boost 
once will once received a boost once will was discovered by the Sumerians. A system of writing was developed to track accounts in the economy of Mesopotamia. So transportation was important. The discovering of the wheel, right? Won't that help? Transportation. This will help boost the economy. What did we, did y'all catch that little clip we, we, we heard in, the, uh, in that little clip? How in the mining towns, the factory towns, they had transportation. Trains, the railroads. That is almost synonymous with the invention of the wheel. So we have mining too. Mining uh, presupposes the ownership of land. This is the same pattern you, saw, you find in Babylon in the Fertile Crescent, the development of agriculture. So here you have in Babylon crops. You have the same thing here, but now they dig an underground, right, for mining projects. Well, they had to dig for land too. Well, they had to dig in the land to make brick and everything else. We see the carbon copy. And notice what, what's boosting it transportation, we have railroads, we have vehicles, trucks, and everything else now. That is synonymous pretty much with the invention of the wheel. Banking institutions. I want to get to this. So Sumer, we have this economy developing in Sumer, or a city in Sumer, Ur of the Chaldees. This is where Abraham was called from. Now this is out of Mesopotamian economics. And you, this is from, you can find this online, Mesopotamian Economics and Money, Facts and Details. You can find it online. Okay, Facts and Details. Notice this. Mesopotamia was the first place where crop surpluses were produced to such a degree that enough labor was free that it could be harnessed to build cities and monuments, produce, art, and crafts and support merchants and temple monarchs, or temples and monarchs. So in other words, they develop so much crop, you, you don't need as many people to grow because you're developing it. So now we could use our labor to build cities and monuments. This is what we read in the, in the Akkadian epic, remember? The building of the, the shrines of the gods, tending to the gods' lands. It's reminiscent of that. The Sumerian used the world's first writing to record economic transactions and participate in a trade network that extended over thousands of miles. I want to read this so we can understand why writing was invented. The necessity of writing. The synony it's synonymous with now with the internet and the computer. They're not doing this for, they're not creating these inventions for our own luxury. They're doing it for transactions and economics, right? The Babylonians are credited with expanding, notice this, expanding commerce and developing an early banking system. This is what the Babylonians are known for. This is what Abraham is being called out of. And his children are to come into the world to undermine this whole establishment. And we're learning how in the world can you be a believer in Messiah and claim you're under the new covenant, but yet and still be in alliance with this establishment. It's contrary to the whole idea of what the Messiah came for. He was crucified, part of the reason he was crucified, because he went into the temple. And what did he do? Turned over the tables and the money changers and the banking, the bankers. He got rid of the bankers out the temple. That's in align with Abraham's covenant, right? If Abraham is to undermine the whole commerce, commercial industry, isn't that what he did in the temple? They wanted him dead for it. So we have the Messiah emblematically telling the rich, rich man, you've got to redistribute your wealth, telling the head of the tax industry, You've been blessed and you are now the son of Abraham because you have taken your wealth and given it back to the poor and restored all you have cheated. Y'all remember that account with Zacchaeus? In fact, I want to read that. Luke, the 18th chapter. Notice, notice the language. 
because the size of Abra the Abrahamic covenant, if the Bible shares it in so many different ways, you've seen Christ crucified naked, confirming it, that covenant being made. You see the sign of the circumcision in his flesh. He has confirmed this covenant. And notice what led him to death by staying on the same road or the same pattern. But remember, Genesis 18, you recall. We're going to Luke now. I want to go to Luke chapter um, 19. But you've got to remember Genesis 18. Abraham's children shall do justice and judgment in order to bring about what Abraham, what he had promised to Abraham. Is the Messiah one of Abraham's children? Yes. yes. When he threw over the money changers and told the rich that they got to redistribute the wealth, was he bringing in justice and judgment? Yes. Absolutely. Now, notice here in Luke chapter 19, verse 1. So, we got to remember this, what we're dealing with, and that is this promise made to Abraham. This promise made to Abraham, and notice the Messiah followed this pattern, so we're going to Luke chapter 19, verse 1. It says, And Jesus entered and, and, and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was chief among the publicans, and he was rich. Now, chief among the publicans, this guy would be a person like he's the head of the IRS. And this day, I have, we have literature to show you, long as the good Lord don't let nothing happen to our information and in our, our, our um, resources. In the days of Rome, there were industries and co uh, corporations of tax collectors. There were corporations that would go to Rome and buy debt, like you have some debt collectors today. Well, you had a big industry among the tax collectors. And we're looking at Jesus of Nazareth going to the head man, a CEO, the head of the tax collectors. Okay. So it's like he's going to have a meeting with the head of the IRS. He's going to have dinner at his house. Now notice, this is the depth of the conversation. These are no peasants. No, this man right here is the chief among them. Now verse 3, and he sought to see Jesus, who he was. And could not for the press because he was little of stature. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he took, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste. Yeah, he knew his name. Isn't that interesting? He knew who he was. And come down. For today I must abide at thy house. That's actually probably, I, I mean, you don't say it, but that's probably who he was looking for. Because he's saying today we got to have a meeting in the case. Why? Notice this. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be a guest or to be guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, and Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, before the Nazarene could get anything out of his mouth, Zacchaeus spoke first. Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I do what? I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusations, which the tax collectors did, that's how they made profit. They had to add more onto the debt. What do we do? If I take in anything by false accusations, I restore him fourfold. So now Zacchaeus have taken his wealth. Remember, he was rich. He gave it back to who he stole from. And then anybody who else needed, he gave to the poor. And what did Jesus of Nazareth say? Verse 9. Careful, pay. notice this. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to your house? You've been saved because you exercise social justice? And not only that, for as much as he is also what? A son of Abraham. What made him a son of Abraham? The justice he just administered. The justice he just administered. 
So we have a tax collector redistributing the wealth in imperial Rome. And Jesus of Nazareth said, now you are the son of God. You, as surely you are the son of Abraham. Because remember what Abraham's children had to do? Let's just read it again for the record and for the camera. Genesis chapter 18. This is no coincidence why the Nazarene is calling him the son of Abraham because he's doing justice to the poor and the afflicted. Genesis 18, 18. Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him that he will command what? His children and his household after him that they and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment. This is why your Nazarene just calls Zacchaeus the son of Abraham. All who he had robbed, all whom he had defrauded, he returned it. So when we look at those today, this so the Nazarene is continuing the covenant made with Abraham. He's following the same pattern of justice. Everyone who we come in contact, he's teaching them to do justice. And the covenant isn't broken because he fulfilled it to the end and Paul confirmed that same covenant, the same goal that God been trying to reach since Genesis, the 12th chapter, is alive and well. That is alive and well to this day. So back with Mesopotamia. Now we see the banking system. We see now, because the chaos will play a part in that, you understand. Remember, most of the, back in Mesopotamia economics, most of the early writing was used to make a list of commodities. The writing system is believed to have developed in response to an increasingly complex society in which records needed to be kept on taxes, rations, agricultural products, tribute to keep the society running smooth. So we see the necessity of writing to keep taxes. Uh, that's why the Babylonians invented that, the early banking system, which we cannot call it the den of thieves. People say, you know, Brother, how can you say that? Yeah, it's a den of thieves. The banking system thrives off interest. Interest is unlawful. If you didn't have interest, the banking system wouldn't exist. The Mesopotamians could also be described as the world's first great accountants. Because they, what is this teaching us? Money was very, wealth was very important. Remember, Babylon is the city of the gods, the city of wealth, and mercantilism. It is very, very important. Babylon, first banking system. Writing was because of their economics and commerce. The wheel was used for the distribution of their economics and commerce. And Abraham was called out of that thriving, bustling society to build a nation which would be in conflict with that manner of society. Jesus of Nazareth in conflict with that manner of society. I want to read something else out of here. This is under the same, this is the same article. This was, in, this was interesting to me, because I mentioned it before, but I want to read it to you, let y'all know I didn't make it up. Modern banking, this is the subtitle, Modern Banking Began in Ancient Babylonian Temple. Isn't that interesting? The mo and that's what they are. The, the modern banks are guided. They are none other than the houses of the gods of mammon. They are guided by an armored tank. A man can go kill another man and a poor man and probably won't do as much time as he went and robbed one of them tanks, a bank. You rob a bank, they throw in a book at you. The banking system in this country when they used to circulate gold, it was a thing called gold shaving. 
The reason why they stop circulating gold is because as gold circulated hands, you know, you will lose a portion of the gold. It will rub off on your hands. So by the time it completed the circuit to get back to the bank, as it went through everybody's hands, you know it wouldn't weigh as much as it did when they first printed it. And one of the reasons why it didn't weigh as much as it did when they first printed it, not only because it would leave people's hands, but people would shave parts of gold off. And it would create new coins. And what happened if you was caught doing that? Death. You were put to death for gold shaking. Look that up. Much like if you counterfeit money today, they waiting for you under the prison. So we see that the modern banking began in ancient Babylonian temples. Why? Now notice this. In ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia, gold, silver, and other valuables were de deposited in temples for safekeeping. The history of banks can be traced to ancient Babylonian temples in the early 2nd millennium BC. This is bringing us into the days of Abraham. In Babylon, at the time of Hammurabi, there are records of loans made by the priests of the temple. Temples took in donations and tax revenue and amassed great wealth. Then they redistributed these goods to the people. But we find out they didn't. They did redistribute them, but they didn't redistribute them in equity. They had to give the people back something else. The people revolt. You couldn't starve them out. And if they didn't revolt, they die off. If you, if you kill everybody off, then we're your workforce. That's why you hear people talking today, well, America trying to kill everybody off. FEMA want to put you in camps. I thought, well, if FEMA put everybody in camps, who's going to go to work? They're not going to put everybody in camps. They're not trying to kill off the population because they don't want to work. They need people to work. After a thousand years, the priests who ran the temples had so much money that the concept of banking came up as an idea. Around the time of Hammurabi in the 18th century BC, the priests allowed the people to take loans. Old Babylonian temples made numerous loans to poor and entrepreneurs in need. Among many other things, and among many other things, the Code of Hammurabi recorded interest-bearing loans. So it was the temples who were became the first banks. What do you think they tried to turn the Temple of Jerusalem into? A bank. That's what they changed over comp, finances, and coins. We have records of this stuff, but it's not in today's teaching. Mesopotamia. Abraham being called out of Babylon. The covenant being confirmed. Abraham's children have been called to do justice and judgment. Any question before we go on? Yeah, if Sumer is Earth. No, it's Sumer is inside of Earth. So let's say Babylon. So let's say Buffalo is Babylon. I'm sorry, New York is Babylon, and Buffalo mm -hmm. is inside of New York. Okay. So it was like that. It was a city in Sumer. Okay. Earth. But it was the. It was like a New York city. Mm -hmm. It was the uh, thriving city, and um, Earth of the Chaldees. Now. If we go to Isaiah, because we said that the promises will come to pass, they've been confirmed that the destruction of Babylon and the nation of Abraham will bring justice and judgment. The prophet Isaiah gave us a clue. And this is what we want. I want to look into this because most I want to next week we're going to start to look into government policies, if you will, or economic systems. Isaiah, the second chapter, verse 1. And the word, or the word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Are, are these supposed to be Abraham's sons, Judah and Jerusalem? Yes. Okay, keep that in mind. Verse 2. It shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains. Mountains often signify governments. So it's saying that the government of God shall be established in the top of the mountains. The mountain of the Lord's house signifying where God shall live. I, got, I, I have to bring this out. I know some people are familiar with our teachings. You're familiar with that. But it's where God lived, right? The mountain of the Lord's house. Now, Psalms 89 Verse 12 teaches us what? 
keep your mind current in Isaiah. Because we're looking at the Lord's house, we're looking at his dwelling, we're looking at his tabernacle. It's all used in different words, but it's simply the dwelling where God, where God dwells, where Elohim dwells. So we go to Psalm 89, we want to put this in and understand this with Isaiah chapter 2. Psalms 89. And Psalms 89 and... Psalm chapter 89. Excuse me one second here. I believe I'm on verse. Um, skip down a little bit here. Verse. I go right to the point. 14. Um, notice this, verse 14. Justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Mercy and truth shall go before thy face. Blessed is the people that know thee, or that know the joyful sound. They shall walk, O Lord, in the light of thy countenance. So the, the people's walking in the light of thy countenance are those who are now brought into the habitation or the throne of God. Do y'all see that there in verses 14 and 15? Blessed are they that shall walk, O Lord, in the light of thy countenance. Countenance signifying his face. Faith signifying his presence. Verse 14, justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Again, his presence, where he dwells. So we're looking at the mountain of the Lord's house. We're looking at where his throne shall sit. We're looking at his habitation. Therefore, in Isaiah 2, we inject justice and judgment because if God's house is here in Isaiah 2, In verse 2, the Lord's house shall be established at the top of the mountains. That's where his throne is. His house is another name for his habitation. Therefore, in Isaiah 2, he's the same. In verse 2, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established at the top of the mountains. What's being established? Justice. Justice and judgment. And shall be exalted above the hills. Because of justice and judgment, the government of God is now exalted above all governments and all nations shall do what? Flow to it. Why? Because they're looking for a blessing. And remember, it's been confirmed. So the prophetic language of Isaiah is pointing us towards the days showing us it's going to happen. Verse 3. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord's house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways. We will walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law, signifying this new covenant. It's a new covenant being made now. And the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge among the nations, shall rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, they, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up war against nation, neither shall they learn Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Notice verse 5. In order for all this to happen, it's reminiscent of Genesis 18. This is to happen. So Isaiah is admonishing the people in verse 5. O house of Jacob, come ye, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Why is he admonishing them to do that? Because if they don't do that, then he can't bring the pass. Remember Genesis 18, 18? Unless the children of Israel walk in the light of the continents of God, in his ways, then all of this we just read in Isaiah 2 cannot come to pass. So he's admonishing them to walk in that way. So under the new covenant, this new covenant everybody claimed to be under, this is the way we're supposed to be walking in. Fighting, standing, teaching, admonishing, all the paths of justice and judgment. That is what his children are to do. Now, this is the dilemma. Many of us don't know what justice and judgment is. What, what does it entail? And therefore, that's why I want to take the next coming weeks to begin to analyze the economic systems. Why economic systems? Because economic systems are none other than the means of distribution for citizens. That's, that, that's simply the heart of it. 
right? Now, if we're looking at Genesis, and we look going back to Genesis, when God said, told man to have dominion over the earth, this entails distribution. As he, as he said, be fruitful and multiply, what kind of system do you put in place so everyone will be provided for? So that's why we want to start to investigate it. Then we want to look and see what manner of system are we as saints to attain and work towards. We ultimately, we know, if we're under the new covenant, whatever system we pursue, whatever uh, 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 teachings that in which we follow, they got to be according to the promises made to Abraham. They got to be leaning towards justice and judgment. So we're going to take our time and look into it. Under the new covenant, are we blessing Jesus because of the economic system? Do we thank God because Taco Bell and, and Mighty Taco and all of these other companies and corporations want to come and set up business in our neighborhoods? Are we to bless God and say because the preachers want to bring in banks and credit unions and everything else into our neighborhoods? Well, let's see. All right, and that's what I want to investigate as we move forward, and that's what we'll be dealing into. So um, online, those of you online, I'll have the book posted. Those of us here, bring that book and your Bible and questions so we can start to make this comparison. And then we're going to go back into God's will and the scriptures to confirm whether the social or communistic principles are actually biblical. And I want to take this route so people can learn and they can see it for themselves. So any questions before we close out? These people understand very well that a revolution means a new situation. Revolution means that the abuses and excesses of the violent, reactionary, and disruptive minority has to be crushed so that the majority interests can prevail. <laughs>